All right, here we go. In our review, we have heard from the Lord through messages in the series Signs of the Times about the preeminence of Christ. So if you get out your bulletins, you'll, you'll find a worksheet there. Uh, the preeminence of Christ. The second one is the ancient ways of righteousness. The third is the violence in the world. And today's is going to be the need of the world, revival. So the preeminence of Jesus, Jesus must be lifted up in every area of our lives so the Father will draw mankind to him. We are his voices. We are his hands and feet and eyes. Amen? We must proclaim who Jesus is to a world that does not want to listen or hear. But that's, that's, what we, that's what our calling is. The Lord Jesus said when he was ascending into heaven in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, he says, all authority has been given to me. Therefore, go into all the world and make disciples. Amen. He didn't say, go get in relationship with everybody. He says, go make disciples. And yes, we want to be friendly to those around us and, 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 and project a, a loving, caring concern for them. But we need to talk to strangers even about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the ancient ways we talked about. The ancient ways, we need to return and stay focused on the ancient ways of righteousness, which are the ways of Jesus Christ. Christ must become the focal point and the theme of all that we do. The theme of all that we do. Every day. Amen? And then the third thing is the violence in the world. We realize that, that violence in the world is due to the fact that the leadership of this world has enormously deviated from the ancient ways of righteousness of Christ. Isn't that right? The further away leaders lead their people away from God, the worse it gets, the worse it gets, no matter how smart they are, amen? We're, we're looking at the, an election cycle where we have two people that are running for president of the United States of America, and both of them have flaws, huge flaws. They're not going to save the world. <laughs> They're not going to save America. Only God through the Lord Jesus Christ, can save the, the, uh, the United States and the world. And he's going to do that because, like we sang, he reigns. He reigns. Now, God's word for today, the, in the fourth part of the signs of the times, is the need of the times, revival. Now, because of the deviation from the ancient ways of Christ as a world, we are headed down a path of doom and gloom. Am I, isn't that true? Is that true? Now listen to this very carefully. Because of the enormous influx of doom and gloom of this world, we have to be made aware of the enormous potential for corruption that is bombarding our minds through the barrage of evil that is prevailing through every form of media into our homes, our hearts, and our minds. Is that true? We're being bombarded. So, the violence, the hatred, the abortion, the homosexuality, the greed, the envy, the covetousness are rampant throughout our country and our culture. Now listen to this. We have to even realize that our diet and our health, our health care, are corrupted by the deviation from God. His plans and his ancient ways of righteousness and health. Amen? There's, there's many, many uh, natural homeopathic remedies for the health problems we have. Amen? Now, even our churches are under vicious attack, vicious attack, but in ways that are so subtle, they are not easily detected. In fact, they appear to be seemingly to be beneficial to reaching unbelievers. I've spoke about this before. Amen? However, in the quest, listen to this carefully, in the quest to reach unbelievers, some churches have lost the real me message 
of repentance of our sinful lives and turning to faith in the life of Christ. It's only in Christ. Now, these, these liberal Christian churches have given into a social gospel and only a casual reference to knowing about Jesus instead of really knowing him, the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Because we are so susceptible to so much corruption, we need to realize, and here it is, that the renewing of our minds is extremely important and revival is and must always be a deliberate, constant part of our daily lives. Does that make sense? We need to be in revival mode every day, not just once or twice a year. Every day we need to be in revival mode because this world is so, so corrupt. So what is revival all about? Let's read from God's word what revival is. Anybody here want to be revived? Anybody want to be part of a great revival? Amen? Amen. Well, here it is. The Lord's going to give it to us. Lord, I have heard the report about you, Lord. I stand in awe of your deeds. Amen? Revive your work in these years. Do we not need a revival of God in these years? Make it known in these years, and in your wrath, remember mercy. Mercy. It goes on to say, in the next PowerPoint screen, Psalm 85, 6. Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Where's, where's rejoicing? Being revived in the Lord. Amen? That's where the rejoicing is. And to revive is, means to nourish, repair, and restore us. Brothers and sisters, we are being bombarded with all kinds of evil constantly. It, ne it never stops or slows down. So because of the much corruption in the world, we are in need, again, of constant, constant nourishment of God. We are always needing repair of our disappointed and broken lives. I, I bet you on, on, a, on a weekly basis, you're, you're disappointed and feel broken many times during the week. Amen? Many times, right? Our souls ache, right? Our rejoicing is in the Lord. Our revival is in the Lord. Go to Him. Amen? We also need the restoring of our lives that only God can bring through his almighty spirit. Only God, his Holy Spirit, can revive our souls with all that, that we are faced with. In Psalm 19, 7, the law of the Lord is what? Perfect. It's perfect or complete. Reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. It is always there. Making wise the simple. If, you're, if you think you're just a simple person, if you have God's wisdom and knowledge, you are wise beyond most people on the earth. Amen? Hallelujah. So, Psalm 19.7, there's an article by Jack Wellman, who's a uh, pastor and an author, and he says, going back to the, to the law of the Lord, 19.7, you cannot separate the word of God from the God of the word. And the same goes for God's laws. His law and his word are synonymous with one another. That means they're interchangeable. God's word, God's law. God's word, God's law. They're interchangeable. Here we see that the law of the Lord is perfect. And by the context of this chapter, we know that the psalmist is not writing about Mosaic law or Jewish law. He's writing about the Ten Commandments. And it's the Ten Commandments that revives the soul. Not the keeping of the Ten Commandments in our flesh, but surrender to God's Holy Spirit that Jesus can keep the commandments for us by our submission and surrender to His will. Amen? Amen? Amen. So, the Greek word for revive is shwub, and it means to return or turn back. 
So revival, as we have previously read, means a turning away from sin and turning toward God and the law of God does the converting or the reviving of the soul. When we turn away from our sin and we turn to God, God revives the soul. Amen? So let's put it this way. This is what uh, Jack Wellman says. It takes a man of God speaking the word of God with the spirit of God to make the children of God for the glory of God. Amen? You can insert... Uh, this applies to men and women and children, all people. So either way, God is the dominant theme here because God and his law or his word revives or quickens the soul. Amen? Now, I'm going to Psalm 51.10. It says, um, this is David. David, a man after God's own heart, he needed revival. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew, refresh, rebuild, revive a right spirit within me. Again, even David, a man after God's own heart, needed constant revival. Acts, the next PowerPoint screen, Acts 3, 19 says, repent therefore, turn back, revival, that your sins may be blotted out, that the times of refreshing, renewing, rebuilding, may come. Revival may come from the presence of the Lord. Amen? And that he may send you, send the Christ appointed for you, which is Jesus. Amen? Jack Wellman also uh, quotes, Peter is, one of the, Peter is one of the most powerful sermons given in the Bible, and he's commanding people to repent. And the Greek word for repent is uh, mana, uh, met metanoio which means to change one's mind turn back is the Greek word epistrepho meaning to turn to God so uh, change one's mind turn to God which will allow our sins to be blotted out now here's the, here's the, here's the key if there's no change of mind there's no turning to God. And if there's no turning to God, there is no forgiveness of sin. There is no salvation. Now, it's been stated, and you've probably heard it many times, that insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. That's insanity, right? So we need God to, to change us. Amen? So, 2 Timothy 2.24 says... And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. How many of you were quarrelsome this week? <laughs> if we're going to serve the Lord, and, and I, I was quarrelsome. <laughs> the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach patiently, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness that God may perhaps grant them repentance and revival leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after having been captured by him to do his will. Do you know most people are captured by Satan to do Satan's will? Another quote from Jack Wilman says, the Greek word for repentance is metanio. Metanio. Met Anoia, metanoia. It, it, and again, it means, it's not just remorse or regret, but it means a change of mind. A change of mind. So revival cannot occur until there's first been a change of mind. We have to change, let God change our minds. And he takes the Spirit of God to do this. Now, only if God grants repentance can a person be led to a knowledge of the truth. Again, we talked about it earlier in the prayer. You can't understand God's word unless the Holy Spirit reveal it to you. He has to reveal it to you, to me. It's supernatural. So here it is, brothers and sisters. What is revival? Revival is renewing our intimate relationship with God through repentance of our busyness. Our preoccupation with our temporal desires, meaning our physical existence here on earth. 
we, myself included, tend to be more concerned about our existence here on earth than what's coming in the kingdom of heaven. And we need a revival for that. So here it is. Um, this being concerned with our physical existence on earth includes being involved with our children's activities, school, sports, and their physical development and putting their and our spiritual development on the back burner. Because life on earth is more important or more fun to us than letting God correct us and change us, including our behaviors. Amen? We all want to think, if you're like me, you all want to think, well, I'm, I'm pretty good. I, I'm good. I, I don't need any more change. <laughs> I don't need any more uh, surrender. I don't need any more uh, transformation. But that's not true. We need a lot of constant transformation. Yes, thank you, brother. So here it is. Here, here's, here's an example. It's like putting, how many of you like lobster? <laughs> it's like putting a lobster into a pot of cool water and turning on the burner, okay? Slowly the lobster is heated up until he passes out and then is cooked to death, right? This is what happens to us if uh, without constant spiritual evaluation of our own lives, me included, of our own lives, we are being corrupted in a pot or cesspool of the world's lust for the flesh. God said all that's in the world is lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And here's what it means. Lust of the, lust of the flesh means longing for comforts of the body. Lust of the eyes is longing for the things that other people have or desires of the many things that are on advertisements on TV. We're all being lured into those things. The pride of life is the boasting or the confidence that we have placed in our possessions or our wealth. So in other words, if God came and took all of your possessions away, would you still have joy in your life? That, that's a big question, isn't it? That's a big question for me. If God took every, every material possession away, would I still have joy? I would pray that I would, and I pray that you would too. Amen? So, uh, instead of seeking God's kingdom and his righteousness, we are being absorbed into the culture of wealth, comfort, and pleasures, just as the Israelites were absorbed into their culture of false idols and false gods. So I'm asking God to move me and you out of our comfort zone into the suffering zone with Jesus. Uh-oh. <laughs> I know you're mad at me now, huh? <laughs> to suffer for Jesus is a joy. To suffer for the gospel's sake is a joy. To sacrifice for the gospel and for, for the Lord Jesus Christ is a joy, no matter what it is. Amen? I, I'm sure many of you have already suffered some of that. But let's be willing to suffer for Jesus for anything. Amen? So, we make a choice every day, which is if we want to be entertained and comforted in our flesh, or if we want to be more like Christ by walking in his spirit and speaking his truth. Instead of being entertained, entertained, let us be ministers of reconciliation of people to God. Amen? Let's, let's be those people. Remember, there's always been a small amount of people, a remnant from the Old Testament through the New Testament of people who are willing to give everything for Jesus. What, is, what does God's word say? If you want to be my disciple, you must be willing to to give up how much? Everything. What is it? Everything. 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 Amen? And you know what? When you're, willing, when you're willing to do that, that's where the joy is. That's where the revival is. Now, if we're going to be entertained, listen to this, and, and, and I like to watch television too, but if we're going to be entertained, let us do or watch things that will bring about a spiritual awakening for us 
or an edification of our spirits in Christ. I, I saw a movie. It was called The Atheist Delusion. It awakened me. It edified me. We need to watch those kinds of programs. Amen? Now, brothers and sisters, that was the doom and gloom. <laughs> We've talked about this before, right? That's the doom and gloom. Here's the glory. You ready for the glory? Yeah. Okay. Now, God is going to give us an opportunity to start revival in our hearts in just a few moments. And it starts out in 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people, say it with me, you guys know it. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land, heal their lives, heal their families. Amen? Amen. The whole thing. So, remember, we must let God remove our busyness and spend quality time with Him and quantity of time with Him. And to witness to the lost and serve His saints. This is exactly what we are studying in our adult Bible study. Please stay and join us in this life-changing Bible study. So here's the glory. You ready? Here's, here's, the, here's the glory. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. Are you living with great expectation? This world stinks, doesn't it? Yeah. This, this life is as good as it is. It, it's, it pales in comparison to we know what God's going to bring us. Amen? We know. So we live with great expectation of how it's going to be perfect in the kingdom of heaven. Where there's no pain, no sorrow, no suffering, no worrying about children, no worrying about all kinds of things because they're, they're choosing the wrong paths. And some of those paths we're choosing as well. He goes on to say, and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you. Our inheritance is in heaven. It is pure, it is undefiled, it is beyond the reach of change or decay. I'm glad of that, amen? It's perfect, it's priceless. There's the glory. It goes on to say, in the next PowerPoint, and through your faith, God's protecting you by his power until you receive his salvation. You're under heavy protection, did you know that? There's a bubble around you. A, a, a bubble that no one can penetrate unless the Father allows it to be penetrated. You are protected by a bubble. You need not fear anyone or anything. You're under the protection of the Lord. And if He allows some trauma or trial to come into your life, it's going to be used to make you even better. Amen? You need not fear. Amen? God is protecting you by his power until you receive his, this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. Is there any joy in the house of the Lord today? Be glad. Let us rejoice. Our, our, our future is secure, more secure than anything that we've ever seen in this entire world. Amen? It's secure. It's secure. Therefore, there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you may endure many trials for a little while. Anybody have trials this week? Or all the time? <laughs> we all do, right? We're all, we're all pushing against something, right? God says, don't, don't worry about it. He says, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. If you can have joy and love and peace during these trials, you're walking in the Spirit. Because only, only God can give you joy and love and peace in trials and tribulations. Amen? That's the revival. That's the revival. Amen? 
it is being, your, your faith is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. Amen? How many of you own any gold? No gold? No gold coins or... Well, as precious as gold may be, and, and by I don't know what it is now, maybe like twelve hundred dollars an ounce of gold. You know, that's about that's a twelve hundred dollars or thirteen hundred dollars for an ounce of gold is about a coin that big. It's like a the size of a of a Kennedy dollar, maybe even a little bit smaller than that. Thirteen hundred dollars an ounce for that little that little coin. Your faith is more precious than any amount of gold. Amen? So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Instead of people saying, oh, you're one of those people, they're going to say, oh, you're one of those people. <laughs> Amen? It's going to be completely turned around. It goes on to say, you love him even though you have never seen him. I've never seen him. Have you? But we love him, right? How do we love him? Because he revealed himself to us in a way that we can't even comprehend by his spirit. Amen? Isn't that powerful? You're special. You're magnificent. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. And though you do not see him now, you trust in him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. Amen? Amen? I know I do. I pray you do too. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. We don't even know how big that is yet, but we know it's bigger than we can imagine. He goes on to say, this salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about this gracious salvation pre prepared for you. The Old Testament prophets were, when the Holy Spirit was telling them what to write down, they're saying, well, well where is, what is this salvation? Where, where, we want to see it. And, and they're saying, uh, even the prophets wanted to know more about it when they prophesied about this gracious salvation prepared for you and for me. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterwards. They were wondering about it. They, they were, well, we want to know more about this. He goes on to say, they were told that their messages were not for them, for themselves, but for you and me. They were for you and me. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is all so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. Right now, the angels are watching you and me. They're saying, oh my gosh, Gloria, Sally, Sylvia, they're, they're walking in the salvation of the Lord. Amen? They're watching you. Did we read all of that last one? Yes. So, sorry, brother. So, so they're, they're watching you. They're watching us. <laughs> uh, it's like... It's like... I think it was Elijah... An army came to arrest Elijah, and his servant was saying, Oh my gosh, they're gonna kill us, they're gonna die, we're gonna die. And and Elijah prayed to God, said, Lord, please open up the eyes of this man that he may see the legions of angels standing around us to protect us. Brothers and sisters, may I give you that vision? There's an there's a legion. Thousands of legions of angels just watching over us. Amen? They're watching over us. We are God's children. We are God's people. So it goes on to say, so prepare your minds for action. God wants to be in action and exercise self-control by surrendering to his spirit. 
Amen? Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Amen? That's where revival is, living as God's obedient children. So don't slip back into old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but we know better now. Amen? We're not here to live for ourselves. We're here to live for the Lord and for others. For, for the Lord and for others. Amen? So it goes on to say, but now you must live holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. It goes on to say, and remember that the heavenly father to whom you pray, he has no favorites. He loves you as much as John MacArthur or any of those Bible scholars that there are. Live a holy, righteous life. Amen? Amen? He will judge or reward you according to what you do. Okay? Are we surrendered to the Lord? He's not going to judge you if there's, judge us if there's five people in here, 50 people in here, or 500 people. He's going to judge us by what we do, how we surrender to God's will and God's plan. Amen? So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. Amen? It goes on to say, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Let us shout out a praise to our God. Amen? The, the sinless, spotless Lamb shed His blood, paid the price for us. Amen? You are forgiven. You are free from any sin and iniquity that, has been, that you have been uh, involved in in your life past, present, and even in the future. Amen? Amen. If, you're, if you're harboring any sin, or if you're harboring any guilt or shame of a sin in the past, forget it. If you've repented from it, God forgave you. And you're flawless. Like we sang, you're flawless. You don't have to grieve about the sin that you did before. If you repented from it and uh, have turned from it and ask God to forgive you for it, it's forgiven. God doesn't even remember it. I mean, he remembers everything, but he's not going to remember it. We probably remember it more than he remembers it. Amen? So live. Live in, in excitement and in, 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 in enthusiasm because you're a flawless, forgiven saint and child of God. Amen? Amen. He goes on to say, God, I think you need to back up. Uh, God chose him as your ransom long before the world began, but now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. This was the first coming of Christ. We're waiting for the second coming. Through Christ, you have come to trust in God. You have placed your faith and hope in God because he raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory. He goes on to say, you were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth. Amen? You were cleansed. You're flawless. So now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters and love each other deeply with all your heart. Amen? I, I love you guys. It's not because I'm a great guy. It's because God is a great God and he gave me his love for you. For you have been born again. Born again. But not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. And we finish with this. As the scriptures say, people are like grass. Their beauty is like flower in the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is the good news, the gospel that was preached to you. And you believed it. Amen? How many of you believed it? 
you're still believing in it. Amen? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, let us now take some time and come forward to the altar here and repent from our busyness, repent from any sin, and let God revive us, refresh us, and renew us, and rebuild us. Amen? To any sin you have, just lay it here because God wants to take it away from you. He doesn't want to take it off your shoulders. And I need to pray too. So come forward. Stand with me. Uh, come forward and let, let us just pray and ask God to remove any sin or any darkness, any, any doubt, any fear, any worry, and bring it to the feet of Jesus. Amen? And pray.